Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pretty Good Gamer Podcast, episode 101. Hello, our Croissant Podcast, Reeve Cantagoon. My name is Mr. Gareth Evans. Joining me today is Mr. Henry. Why the fuck is there nothing going on, Cooper? Uh, I, I have nothing to say. There's nothing going on at all. At least, you know, Resident Evil 8 is out, and people can talk about that. So that's something for like five seconds, and then it's quiet again. But I mean, it is what it is, I suppose. New console all- generation and all that jazz. It is all quiet on the Western Front, as they say. Um, but we've got we've got a few things to talk about. I'm, today I'll be talking about Total War Run Remastered, uh, which I've been playing since it released, which I'm having a good time with. Henry will be discussing the reviews of aforementioned Resident Evil Village. Uh, then we'll be taking the questions and then reading some comments and then doing the bad dad joke of the week to finish off. Uh, before any of that, what you been up to this week? Been playing much... Not really much this week. Um, I went back to Red Dead, which I've been playing through on uh, on PC for a bit, just dabbling in it. Well, I say dabbling. It's not the kind of game I dabble with. I'll end up playing for hours at a time. Well, it's, I mean, depends on your definition of dabbling. I'm not doing a lot in the game, but I'm spending a lot of time doing it. <laughs> I'm just pissing about in the open world. But yeah, not not really um much else. Just pretty, you know, chilled out, casual week. Considering there's fuck all well, there was going on. Day, bank holiday weekend, so I can assume that. You had a bit of a bit of a celebration, maybe? Maybe. No. Maybe. Just, maybe not. Just a guess. Maybe. I don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> not me. I definitely didn't do it on Friday, Sunday, and Monday. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll we'll leave that. Uh, I mean, you got to, you? You got to take advantage of it. Exactly. The fact that places are opening up now, and you know, people have been living under under uh, in their own homes for. God knows how long. We can forgive you this one, Henry. We'll let you just have that one. one. Not just the, this one. Not just six weeks preceding it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we'll jump into Ro- Total War Rome Remastered to give its, its proper title. Uh, I've been playing this since it released, uh, which was uh, last Friday. And everything I'm about to say, based on nine hours of gameplay and my experience playing it um, when I was younger, obviously, I loved this game and my opinion about and everything I'm going to say must be um, preface, 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 prefaced, prefaced with that, whatever the word is, um, that um, I loved the original game and uh, I played it to a large extent. It is my favorite Total War game, bar none. Uh, I, I haven't really played a lot of the modern Total War games either. So um, again, I'll touch on that slightly later on in the discussion too. So released the 29th of April, £25 is the remastered price. Um, and if you've already if you already own the original, you get it half price. So it's twelve pound fifty if you already own the original on Steam. Or if you have a disc, you can just tell them your disc code number or something, and then you can get it um, half price too. The game comes with the Alexander and Barbarian Invasion DLCs, as well as the Enhanced Graphics Pack DLC, um, which is upgraded upgraded ch- textures on the campaign map, map and in battles. So um, it's as far as I'm concerned, full game um, with all the DLC and half price for people who already own it. So that in itself is a, is a bargain in my my eyes. So what changes have they made? Yeah, this is a remastered, but they have changed some. It's not it's not a um, remake. So they've not just like made it from the ground up. They've, they've remastered the original, but they've, I've changed a few of things, uh, mainly quality of life improvements. So, um, however. I must note that you can play it in its original form without the new mechanics. If you want to do that, you've got a choice of whichever ones you want to add or subtract. Um, I've just been playing it in the remastered version so far, but if you do like the original and you want to stick to the original, you can do that. Um, so the improvements, as far as I'm concerned, are the UI is a lot better in terms of controlling agents. You don't have to scour the map anymore to find them. There's like a little UI thing that you can click on a click on a town or something and then you could just send an agent from that UI panel that pops up or you can click on an enemy or you can click on um, a resource or something and see what, what agents you've got available that can interact with that, which is a quality of life improvement um, hands down there. So it saves you having to manually go and <laughs> click up, find the agent on the map and then forget about them. Uh, and also there's a pop-up as well. You've got, a, you've got this unit or agent um, that's been um, 
that's been doing nothing for three turns. What do you want to do with it? You know, it's that type of thing because that does tend to happen in these games when you've got like a big sprawling empire and you can't keep track of all your um, units. Uh, they've added a merchant um, agent now, so you can generate one merchant per um, town that has a market, and you can send them off to like faraway places to trade. So that's a new mechanic. Uh, also, diplomacy is improved where you can ask for compensation from um, somebody who's done you wrong in the past or somebody who's incurred in, on your lands. You can just um, open dip diplomatic conversation and ask for compensation for that, and that might lead to war or you might get something in return for that. And oh, at the same time, you can smooth over some of the people that you've wronged in the past by using compensation as well. Just pay them off, essentially. There are other tweaks uh, and improvements to AI uh, the campaign and battles, etc. Um, but I'm not just going to gloss over them for now. The main thing that hit me first was the nostalgia, um, because, like I said, this is one of my favourite games in the franchise. Uh, having not played many of the recent Total Wars or much of the recent, I played Britannia um, for a good uh, while, but I've not been interested in the Warhammer ones because the fantasy genre setting isn't really my cup of tea. Um, Loads of people love those, however, but um, yeah. Uh, so, but this nostalgia is what hits you. Is the the music? It's all very familiar, and the and the, like when the generals start um, giving the pre-battle speeches, you like you get all. <laughs> you imagine the uh, yeah. like the Braveheart speech. Uh, they will never take our lives. Or they might take our lives. I don't even. I've even butchered that, but um, I don't remember any of these speeches. But it's it's all it all hits the right notes, and it's. Um, and I think the the people who are going to get the most out of this are the people who have played the original and have fond memories of the original, because I I would definitely recommend this to people um, if you do remember it and loved it um, originally. Um, and that's basically what is good about this game. They haven't changed too much, um, but what was great about the original is just the setup it, um, to begin with. It's basically you play as Rome. Surprise, surprise! The game's called Rome, but. Rome is split up to four factions, three main factions, and then like the SPQR, which is the um, s the Senate. So you get to pick from three th these three factions, and depending on where which faction you choose, you're supposed to expand in a certain direction outside of the map. You're central to the map, and then everyone else, you know, you build the Roman Empire. You go out, you go outwards. So you can choose to be um, one of the main factions of Rome, or you can play against the main factions of Rome, be another faction, basically try and resist the expansion of the empire. And I, I just like that um, like that setup where you're, there's this solid force in the middle of the map expanding and you, you're either part of that or you're against that. And then eventually when the Roman empire gets so big, the three factions in the end game turn in on themselves and they try and conquer the central SPQR, which is the Senate, and I think that setup is just, it's just fantastic. I think oh, I love that. And also, what rem um, reminded me that, that playing as the Roman um, faction, you have some of the best foot soldiers, uh, infantry units in in strategy games, as far as I'm concerned. Hastati, which is the light infantry units, you expect them to be pretty um, robust uh, and. They're supposed to be light units, but they're almost pretty much um, heavy units because they've got this super strong javelin attack and they're really strong in the defense. Um, and this javelin attack, so it makes them kind of a melee, a melee unit and a ranged unit at the same time. They've got limited javelins, but when, when they're approaching or they're attacking, they'll just stop in front of the enemy, throw three or four rounds of javelins to just soften them up and just go and finish them off. And... It's just exceptional. Uh, I, I just love that about the infantry units in this game. As well as like this, the, on the Greek side, you've got the Spartan Hoplites, which are the best spearmen out of any game. Uh, and they will just resist. You know, you stick them down an alleyway in a, in a um, city and they'll just, they'll just sit there forever. You know, imagine 300 yep. with like... Uh, That's what I was going <laughs> to say. Just sitting there on... Just, just, uh, it's, 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 it's beautiful. Especially when you're outnumbered as, as Greeks, it can make for some awesome... Uh, memories that's for sure um yeah so that whole up the whole game that's that's what i love about it. i love the scene i love the setting i love the genre i love the, the time period um everything about it um as for my experience playing this time i played as julii who are my favorite of the three roman factions 
Um, I set the difficulty hard on campaign map and hard on the battles, um, which is actually taken easy. I usually play it on very difficult, very difficult um, f historically it's on It's funny because you, and, and, you complain about not wanting to play like hard games because you just want to have fun. But then when it comes to strategy games, totally different scenario. You're as hard as you can possibly get on those. Well, it's because I know the setup so well mm. with it and I know the strengths of the units. And I don't think... I think until you know the strengths of each unit and the weaknesses of each unit, it, it's very difficult. You know, you can get o overwhelmed so easily. But if you're, if if you know what the units are good for and how to how to attack, how to approach the enemy units, um, then I think going on hard hard is um, you know it's just way too easy on normal. That's for sure. Uh, I I went on hard hard like I said. Uh, but my next playthrough will be very hard, very hard, because I've made a lot of progress just in the in the nine hours that I've played so far. I made it all the way up to France, so I've just basically decimated France. I'm just about to cross the Iberian Mountains towards Spain, and then I'm into like Germany to the um, eastern front as well, and then I'm going to cross into Britain. So from Julia's northwest beginning, I've kind of expanded all the way as far as I can, speared all the way through um, the mainland. Um, so yeah, I be as I began, I wanted to talk about a couple of my sessions, right? Because it gives you a, a nice kind of feel for how the game played out for me. So my very first session, um, I expanded into four regions, and then I was bearing over the fifth region, which is called Medolanium, um, which is on my northwest border towards Gaul, which is where the Gauls are sat. And I sent my full stack of army with my faction leader to take out the town, but I was met with the two stacks of Gaul defenders. And as good as the Roman army are, that is two to one uh, disadvantage. You're not going to, you know, I had no re reinforcements <laughs> and my faction leader was at risk. It was a pretty hairy situation. So I didn't really want to retreat because um, I, I, I'm just not like that. I'm not all about the retreating, right? So what I did, I managed to wing it. And this is, this is like a beauty of these strategy games. It's like trying win no matter what right try and just try and get out of this situation what what are your options so what i ended up doing is i sent in a diplomat and i asked how much it would cost for one of those stacks to just quietly go away into the fields and they said oh fifteen thousand denarii and i was like well i've got 20 grand i'll do it so i just basically paid off one of those armies one of those stacks and they just disappeared and then uh what that allowed me to do was um, take on the battle with just a, a, one stack on one stack and the Roman army early game is easy going to over, overcome that so in one fell swoop I snatched a victory from the jaws of defeat I killed the Gaul king I decimated their local resistance and I paved the way for further expansion into their territory to the northwest uh, and that was basically the end of my session and it was an amazing start to the game I was like yes this is what I've been missing in strategy games amazing however on my second session um, I was at the pinnacle of another um, takeover on the Gaul front uh, of a Gaul stronghold. And during the decisive battle, uh, the game actually crashed to desktop. And um, <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't a good ending. I knew to there my, was a bug uh, coming, but I didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, was, that kind of balances out the, what, what's great about the game. It's, it's, it's simplicity, really, because it, it allows you to focus on the conquering, the the battles, the you don't have to spend too much time in, in colony management. If you don't, you can a, you know AI um, manage that if you want to. I don't. I I uh, manage it all myself anyway. But it, I, I think that's what's beautiful about this game is that it, it's simple to the point where it, it its focus is on just what's great about it, which is just expanding and conquering and taking over, which is what you'd expect to do. It's highly on theme. The Rome to Empire is is you know. You've got to build a Roman Empire, and this is what it's set, it's set out to achieve. And it does that fantastically. However, the crashes um, to desktop, which happened like two more times. So in the nine hours I played, three times it happened. Not great. Um, but yeah, it gives you a little bit of a taste of the good points and bad points as far as I'm concerned. A lot of people are saying that 
Um, well, talking about the reception specifically, 75% on Metacritic, 74 on OpenCritic, 70% approval rating on Steam. It isn't great, um, that's got to be said, but it's not the whole story. A lot of reviewers who talk about the game are criticising it for it not standing up to the modern Total War games. Mm. And I can totally understand that. There's um, all new me- uh, mechanics that they do now. They, um you know, it's not it's not comparable to a modern Total War game. This is just a remaster at the end of the day. It's not a remake. It doesn't have the modern sensibilities or the contemporary feel um, that those newer games have. The UIs are going to be different because this is this is re, you know a remake, not a remake, a remaster of a of an old game. It's an eighteen year old game we're talking about here. It's not supposed to be a new game, and it's a, I think it's aimed at the um, the people who have nostalgic feelings towards this game. It's not aimed at the modern Total War um, crowd, I don't think, and it doesn't definitely doesn't have the modern bells and whistles that you'd expect from um, a modern Total War game. So that's what you know. That's what it's getting its criticism for, and I can understand that. Um, but for me, that isn't the problem because, like I kind of touched on before, less is more when it comes to um, s- some games. I mean, you're talking, I've talked about this in the past, but modern AAA games are like a race to the top in terms of um, how much shit you can cram your game with. And, you know, you talk about Ubisoft, Ubisoftification mm. or whatever, they're just, they're just adding so much stuff into our game, so many different mechanics. And what ends up happening is it waters down. Um, what's actually there? If you add so much stuff, it's just there's just too much stuff to a point. So I feel I, obviously a lot of people might disagree. Um, I think a lot of this is down to the pressure of reviewers always saying stuff like it brings nothing new to the table, and and like <laughs> how can you review a game yeah. based on what new stuff it brings to the table? You should be you should be judging the game on how well it plays, how good it is to Sometimes play. Sometimes the Not stuff on. they bring to the table, the new stuff, is shit when the old stuff was really, really good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could bring five new things to the table and it's all shit and it all waters down what is actually good about a game and I, th- I think that does to some extent put some pressure on these uh, AAA developers because, you know, reviews matter to them. You know, they get paid bonuses based on reviews that, you know, to, to think that reviews don't matter to AAA developers um, would be wrong. It definitely does. Um, but I'm not looking for anything new in this sense. And I don't think if you come into Rome Total War, or Total War Rome Remastered to give its proper title, if you come into that looking for something new, um, to looking for new features and mechanics, that, that isn't what you, you, you know, you shouldn't, you should basically not be interested in this game. You should look elsewhere for a game. Um, but that's not what I'm looking for. That's not what I enjoyed about this game. I'm just looking for a solid focused gameplay experience with the core mechanics uh, that makes sense for the game and the and the and the theme of the game um so you know i'm not interested in having bloat or extras or anything that distracts from what is already a core winning formula something that works really well why would you add everything else that you add on to that is distracting from what works well and i think um some game developers just miss lose sight of that and i think um ubisoft assassin's creed is a is a plain is a obvious example of that happening um anyway so kind of in summary um T- rome total war rome remastered get the fucking name right um it takes everything that was great about the original and enhances it and it, and it doesn't blow it with any unnecessary nonsense and if you loved like myself if you loved the original and you loved the setting um and love the period and you don't really if you don't really play the modern Total War games like me, then I would hugely recommend this game. Definitely um, try it out, especially if you have the original £12.50. Like who, for a complete game with all the expansions, I'm, I'm planning on finishing my first playthrough and then jumping into Barbarian Invasion and seeing what, what that's, all, that's all about. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's all i got to yeah. say, basically. I <laughs> can't I sing it. its praises any, any higher by the sounds of it. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's it is um, tempered by the fact that it's not for everybody, right? It's not yeah. if you if you're interested in getting a modern um, strategy game with all the bells and whistles, bells and whistles, this isn't it, right? But if you are looking, I think there's there's a lot of value in simplicity, and I talked about it last week um, with a game that was a bit like Civ. That it's like sometimes if you strip away all the bloat and all the um, really complex. Um, 
mechanics some, and all you're left with some is like the the core good gameplay loop that's all you need you all you need is a uh, a rewarding gameplay loop and that's what this game has it doesn't matter that it doesn't have all the fancy graphics and all the up-to-date engine and sometimes the pathfinding is a bit wonky a lot of people be shouting sometimes what do you mean it's all shit i understand a lot of people's frustrations with these older games but it's immaterial to me um as long as the gameplay loop is rewarding i'll keep playing the game it's the same with uh, any fallout game uh, you know it's, it's the core loop of the game is great. I'll just keep grinding through it, and I won't feel like it's. I'll just enjoy every moment of it, and that's what I'll do with this game. So yeah, there you have it. That was uh, Total War Rome Remastered. A big two thumbs up for me, but um, it is it is with its caveats that it's not for everybody. I feel like I've said about seven words in the past twenty minutes. Uh, I just can't just let you go. You wound you up and, and watch you go to talk about a game. It's nice to talk about a game that's that's good and and you enjoy for a change because the amount of bad press and bad news happen seemingly happens all the time it's easy to get bogged down in the negative stuff so when you can talk about a game in pretty much pure positive terms it's a it's a real good time well it is rare, rare that i like a game this much mm. and i mean I, I like the game despite its flaws and it's and it's like it, all that matters is my enjoyment that's it full stop like it doesn't matter that some of it's a bit wonky that it's a little bit dated here or there's a little bit of a uh, problem with like AI or whatever, yeah. it doesn't matter. If I'm having fun playing a game, it doesn't matter. Uh, and none of that matters to me. And so if I'm, I'm very, I very rarely play a game like this where I can, I could just for hours and hours grind through it. And it's, and it's, <laughs> and it's that, um, that old, or just one more turn syndrome. It's like, I always, yeah. I keep telling myself, right, at the end of this turn, I'm gonna quit now, I'm gonna make myself some food or go and do what I, what I need to do. And then I just come to the end of the turn and I'm like, well, all I have to do is press the button. And then once the button's, I can just see what happens at the start of the next turn. And then the next turn starts and I'm like, well, it's not gonna hurt if I just move this unit there and just like arrange some this and that. And before you know it, you've done four or five turns and you're like, shit, I wanted to stop fucking 20 minutes ago. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, uh, I don't wanna say addictive because it's got negative connotations, but it's more-ish. Like it just, yeah. it just makes you want to continue. You just have to continue no matter what. Um, but there you go. There's no record transactions, so um, it can be addictive. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, they're not uh, forcing you to, to pay money or anything that you don't want. Uh, well, I guess that's a uh, perfect time to move on to the second part, which is, again, it's generally positive. It's not you know positive across the board, and I've not played it. But we're going to talk about Resident Evil. It's either Resident Evil Village or Resident Evil 8. I generally use both terms because it's such a clumsy title because it spells it with the Roman numeral, but with the uh, the I and the two L's and, I'm like, and the V, it looks awful. So, Resident Evil Village. The reviews came out, I, I think, yesterday at the time of recording, so that was Wednesday. Today is Thursday, and it will be out tomorrow, which is Friday, and by the time you're watching this, all of that is long in the past. Um, so, it continues the, the, the first-person perspective from Resident Evil 7 and has the same main character, um, so it is still, you know, different to classic Resident Evil, but this one is meant to have brought in a few more classical elements and still kept the Resident Evil 7 kind of vibe but still trying to be its own thing. At least that's the goal and then we'll get to the review see if that was a success uh, in a bit. Uh, from what I can gather, the I've, I've tried to avoid spoilers and stuff for this as much as possible and I do intend to get it. I plan to do ahead of reviews and now the reviews are out, I probably still will get it. Uh, so the cons the the like trigger the starting point is your daughter gets kidnapped and you track her down to this mysterious village in the middle of Europe and it's basically Transylvania. It really leans into traditional horror tropes as opposed to classic, you know, Resident Evil zombie stuff. There's the infamous big vampire lady who I'm not sure anyone really knows quite how to pronounce her name. Uh, where's, I've got it written down here because I need to read it so I can say it. Uh, lady... I believe it's Dimitrescu. You don't say the U on the end, but, but apparently there's a U on the end. Um, so yeah, it's Resident Evil. You're going to be shooting some stuff a little bit. You're going to be hopefully scared a little bit if it's actually a good Resident Evil game. But we'll uh, we'll see about that. So I've collected a few different reviews, um, not loads because on Metacritic there were about sixty something. I think uh, no seventy. There were seventy reviews for PS5 on. Metacritic, 64 positive, 6 mixed, and 0 negative, so that's pretty good uh, across the board. And it, there were also some reviews for Xbox Series X and PC, but the significant bulk of them were on PS5, so just 
bear that in mind with um, what I'm saying. Uh, I tried to look up if there were any glaring performance problems across the different consoles, and so far I don't believe there are from what I've what, I'm, what I've read. Again, that may be wrong, and everyone's experience differs. Uh, but yeah, just bear that in mind. So the first one, I've I've got a couple from the top end and a couple from the bottom end, and then one in the middle. Uh, so this first one is from Game Informer that I've got, which gave it a 9.25 by Ben Reeves, and the little tagline was painting the ghost town red. Village doesn't pull any punches when it comes to horror, but a consistent rollout of new weapons and tools makes it hard to walk away from these terrors. Very spooky indeed. Someone got his li someone got scared. That's my big thing with a horror game. If it or, and horror films, I generally don't like horror films because if they don't scare me, then what's the point? Um, I think a lot of them are. Just, but they're boring. They're but they don't. They're predictable and dull. However, the select few that I do like, I really like. You know, I, I really rate them. Anyway, so the, I know, it carries on a bit more. Uh, Resident Evil Village is an impressive package. I love the recent remakes of Resident Evil 2 and 3, but I'm excited to see Capcom push the series forward again. Village expands on Resident Evil 7 Biohazard's approach to first-person combat, offering a series of white-knuckle encounters that perfectly complement Capcom's unnerving environmental design. Thankfully, Village's amplified action doesn't diminish its horror. Now, that line is important, because I think that's going to be the stickler on either side um, for most people. You will either like the more action or like the more horror and this each game is has a slightly different balance of that and that will then determine your opinion and people vary wildly across that uh it carries on if anything village maintains a sense of dread that few games can match if you have mm, Excuse me. If you have the intestinal fortitude for intense horror, playing Resident Evil Village is a great way to check your pulse. So it's going to be nasty, it's going to be gory, Ben Reeves thinks it's quite scary. Now I, I highlight that because that seems to be one of the, not necessarily criticisms, but people who are critical of it criticise the lack of scares, but people who like it still, still thought it was scary, so I guess there's a bit of a variability there. Next one is from Digital Trends, and forgive me if I mispronounce this name, Giovanni Colatonio? I'm going to say that. Col Colantonio? Sounds good to me. He gave it 3 out of 5, so pretty much in the middle, in the middle of the range. It's still one of the lower ones on Metacritic, but you know, out of the you know, out of ten, it's fairly close to the middle. Said franchises highs and lows crammed into one package, so it's got a bit of the good, a bit of the bad. Resident Evil Village is an uneven anthology of horror of horror movie set send ups. Sometimes it offers a truly exciting vision of the series' future with imaginative world-building and rewarding exploration. Other times, it's a fairly run-of-the-mill shooter that struggles to provide any real stakes or tension. See, see that's what I mean. This is an important part of the uh, discussion here is, is it scary? Uh, these two tones are often at odds with one another, highlighting all of the franchise's best and worst instincts in one eclectic package. Chalk it up to quarter-life Chalk it up to a quarter-life crisis. Goodness me. Um, so yeah, again, there's some good stuff in there. Uh, the world building and kind of environments and the village itself seems to be quite a consistent um, thing that was praised among most of the reviewers. Uh, so it's based in the village and then there are like bits that come off it. The village is sort of like a hub. I don't really think that's the correct way to put it. It's not like open world or anything, but it, you go to the village and then you can access the different areas throughout the campaign. I think there's four um, which all have their own like boss character thing. And it seems to be that the this game is designed almost like a theme park, where each um, area outside of the village is kind of a different type of horror. And I think for some people that was a really fun um, way to experience a few different types of things all in one game, but for others it led to a very, very disjointed experience, especially in terms of narrative, because that narrative and characters are one of the most consistent um, complaints about this game, on top of the up and, uh, up and down quality of scares uh, so in terms of likes and dislikes which i really like it when reviewers do this it makes it so much quicker just to be able to be like oh here's what you like here's what you dislike and then you can compare that nice and easily uh, quickly he likes the world building the big set pieces which um resident evil has always been very good at that exploration and the village itself but dislikes its uneven structure has weak action which is uh for a horror game which leans more into action this time if you've got weak action that's a bad sign as well as the uh, lack of scares and a lack of tension um, one of my favorite things he, this person mentions is, uh, he says, basically, other other Resident Evil games do what this one does better in different aspects. So he says, try number two for the exploration, number three for the action, or number seven for the horror. 
So if you want any of those specific types of experience from Resident Evil game, just play a different one, which isn't exactly what you want to hear from a new one, but it's, it's his opinion. I don't know. Next one is another very, very positive one from GameSpot's Phil Hornshaw, 9 out of 10. The sequel to Resident Evil 7 leans heavily on Resident Evil 4's brand of action, but adds its own sensibilities to the mix. Resident Evil 7 was an excellent return to the horror underpinning, underpinnings of the franchise, but cunningly altered with new ideas and a new perspective. Similarly, Village is an intelligent reintroduction of the, se of the best action elements of Resident Evil, though it captures some of the same things that made... Though it captures some of the same things that made RE7 such a breath of fresh air, or maybe rancid, stale, mold-filled air, but in a good way. I hate how some of these reviewers write, it just makes me want to stick needles in my eyes. Uh, Village mm. evolves to become its own unique creature. It makes you wonder what beautifully twisted fiend Resident Evil might mutate into the future. Into, into the future. So again, very, very positive. Likes the mix of classic design elements with the more modern sensibilities of 7, especially 4. I think um, the fact that it's in a, in a spooky village is very reminiscent of Resident Evil 4 because that was the same kind of setting. And um, its approach to its inventory and, and resource management is very, very similar to that. Um, they also like the changes in pace, but it's in terms of game design and, and how it tells its story and whatnot, but it's still feels like a Resident Evil game. Combat is tight, especially in Mercenaries mode, and I'll just quickly say, Mercenaries mode is like, it's essentially like a survival challenge arcade mode, but it's hyper, hyper action focused. It's, it's more like a time trial, and you're just trying to get the best score you can. Uh, very, very arcadey, very fun. Um, and it mentions one part in particular, but doesn't give any context for why that's good, uh, and presumably that, that's for spoilers, but I, I think it's a bit of a random point to put in a uh, in that part of a review, but I mean, I, I can't criti criticize it. Uh, in terms of dislikes, it says there's too much action in the last hour to the point where it feels like basically a totally different game. The villains are fun, but connections to the wider franchise are very weak, which is something I think, for me, the number seven struggled with as well, because I like Resident Evil. I've played most of them in, in some capacity, some more than others. Uh, but 7, I felt like this is such a good game on its own. It could just not be Resident Evil and it would be totally fine. And then you kind of get to the end and it's like, oh, here's Umbrella because it has to be or something like that. And a bit like, I kind of would have preferred it if you were just your own thing. But uh, I still really like the game. Um, so the next one is another more negative one. But again, it's not, you know, it's not a, like a zero or anything. It's from Games Radar's Leon Hurley who gave it 3.5 out of 5 and said the excellence in some parts only highlights the more ordinary moments. And um, for most of the others, I've picked their, like, their conclusion paragraph to read out. But this one, I think, what sums it up best is actually his opening paragraph, which basically says that throughout their playtime, it could have been a 7, it could have been an 8, it could have been a 6, it could have even been a 10, but it's so up and down at different points, which is... Kind of, I think it'd be better if it was just a solid sixth route than an up and down six, because then you have no idea what's going on. All right, so I feel like I want to give Resident Evil Village a running commentary of scores, such as the range and the variety of its sections. Eight, nine, Jesus, maybe a ten, eight, seven, six. There's so much going on, but it chops and changes from beat to beat in such a way that you can almost see the line between sections. Most notably, it feels like a real it feels like there's a real difference between the first and second half. The opening is strong, clever, and fun, full of atmosphere and intrigue as you explore, and features a part that's probably one of the best standalone horror levels of the year. While the latter half veers into okay territory, with some combat slogs, a boss fight that's a bit of a stretch, a bit of a stretch, ah, a bit of a stretch, even by Resident Evil standards, and while it's still good, lacks the same spark and craft as the beginning. And now that was quite a long sentence, or paragraph rather, um, and that I think what I like about this one is that's a big problem I have with a lot of Resident Evil games is they. Re I don't know if it's by like a conscious choice, but they seem everyone seems to sh shift more actiony towards the end, and I guess they run out of steam on how to keep the scares going or how to keep tension because I guess if you're playing for a long, I I'm uh, making horror games is probably one of the hardest genres to make in terms of like like tone and um, making sure people are consistently scared. So it's it's a tough line to walk, but. This is one thing that may... This review in particular is one where I went, oh, I don't know. Like, I'll still, I'll still probably get the game, but this one I was a bit like, okay, I, I, I can see myself disliking that that part about it. Uh, in terms of likes, again, it says it starts well, has some good characters, and one exceptional horror moment. Reading that in a 
in and of itself, it sounds like, wow, in the whole game, there's one really good fucking horror moment. But I guess the point they're trying to make when you read the whole review is that there is one really, 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 really good moment, and the rest of it's just good across the board. In terms of dislikes, he says it's inconsistent, it doesn't end strong, and there's some really daft stuff. Resident Evil is full of daft stuff anyway, so if, if it's daft by Resident Evil standards, it must be really, really weird. Uh, and then my last... Um, uh, like traditional review, let's say, is from IGN's uh, Tristan Ogi Ogi Ogilvy. I'm gonna say Ogil Ogilvy. Ogilvy yeah. uh, eight out of ten, mm. so still uh, pretty damn good, and called it a European slaycation. Roaming the streets of Resident Evil Village is like visiting a disturbing and deadly Disneyland, where every attraction is a house of horrors. I got just as big a thrill out of reveling in its frenzied violence as I did retracing my steps through the gradually revealed recesses of its sizable village setting to uncover the darkest story secrets of its monstrous main cast. Good golly, that's a lot, there's a lot of adjectives that's in there. That's a sentence. Uh, boss fights are a bit of a letdown, but the variety of enemies throughout keep things tense, especially in hardcore mode. The fact that it's very much a throwback to the fast-paced action of Resident Evil 4 also means it largely takes a step back from the slow burn scares of Resident Evil 7's excellent opening hours, which may well disappoint those who prefer more psychological dread to blowing off heads. But if you have an itch for action-heavy survival horror, then Resident Evil Village will scratch it like a fistful of Lady Di Oh no, here's her name again. Like a fistful of La Lady Dimi Dimi Dim Dimitrescu. Lady Dimitrescu's freakish fingernails, because she's got big old claws and she'll scratch that itch, and I'm sure many of you watching really, want, really, really want her to. Um, <laughs> this one again, I really liked Seven and how it spanned things up. Again, it went super actiony towards the end, but the opening was um, was really good. If but if you're looking for psychological horror, that's generally not what Resident Evil does. Generally, it's it's horrific body horror with gross shit and some quite uncomfortable scenes, and that's why. Resident Evil 7 qu felt quite a little bit different to some, quite a little bit, what an oxymoron. Um, a fair mm -hmm. bit different to some of the other ones because it did spin things up a little bit. But I, I, if you're, I guess if you're looking for that again, you're not going to find it because this is more classic, more like, gruesome, nasty horror. Um, so in terms of my general impressions from the reviews, again, I haven't played it. By the time you're watching this, I may have played it. I don't know if I'm going to buy it straight away because um, there's a few other things I've got to um, work through at the moment. So my general impressions are that it's less horror, more action. Like I said, this principle and where you land on it will define your opinion of every single Resident Evil game. If you like the more action side, uh, you'll probably really enjoy this one. But if you like the more horror side, you probably won't enjoy this one as much. Um, in terms of narrative and characters, these are, seem to be the most consistent... Um, compl again, complaints not quite right, but they just say they're not great. Um, and they're a bit uneven and, and inconsistent. This is the most consistently inconsistent thing. But the gameplay itself is solid. Though I have seen some complaints about the PC controls, considering it's a first-person shooter, which is pretty rough. I mean, it's a FPS. It should always be better on, on PC. But I've seen a couple of people saying it, it's just not, which is a real shame. But uh, again, I've not played it, so you'll just have to bear that in mind. Um, one thing that a couple of the reviews mentioned, which should be definitely mentioned in terms of like a marketing angle... A key selling point of the game has been Lady Dimitrescu and how she's a big stompy woman with big boobs and she's going to come kill you. And like, oh no, she's going to kill me? <laughs> what? Because she's, you know, she's a total MILF. But apparently, she's actually used very sparingly. She only appears in her section and there are um, three other main bosses who have um, their own sections in the village and they, they kind of like run the town from, from what I can gather anyway. Um, so yeah, if you were going into the game expecting her to stalk you like... I don't know, like the alien in Alien Isolation throughout the entire game, that's not the case. So, um, that, that is, that, I will admit, that is a bit disappointing. I wanted to be stalked by a, by a nine foot woman with her long fingernails, but alas, we can't have everything. Uh, now the final yeah. review, I kind of want to, uh, just, just a passing mention really, rather than, you know, like a direct quotes or anything, is a skill ups review. And I generally don't do, if I'm ever doing a review roundup, I generally stick to the, um, traditional reviews rather than, uh, YouTube ones because I think it's just easier to br um, break them down per personally anyway. It's not it doesn't mean I agree with all the journalists or don't agree with the YouTubers. It's just the way I break things down. But his I think was really interesting and some of his reviews I don't agree with. Some of them I do. But this point I th I really liked. He basically he didn't like the game. It wasn't for him and he acknowledged that. But he still recommended it as someone who can see how other people would really like that. And that's how I always try to do um, my reviews. I don't always succeed. I'm sure. Uh, but I always try to be 
like I think I said about um um Assassin's Creed Valhalla. On balance, I still like that game. It's full of bullshit, but on balance, I still like it. And I think I said uh, I could see this being someone's game of the year. Like it's not mine, but um, mm. there's a lot that I can see other people really latching onto in terms of like the amount of content. And a similar thing here with um, Resident Evil. He said he. He really, really likes 7, and I think he even went so far as to say 7 is his favourite Resident Evil game, which is blasphemy if you ask the wider community, but I don't give a shit, like what you like, man. Um, so yeah, I, I just thought there was a really nice way of um, articulating his point, because I don't believe reviews should be entirely objective. They should be, you know, you should acknowledge that you are in a unique position compared to every other reviewer, uh, and that will play a role in your review process. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of a collection of the reviews. It is out tomorrow, which is the 7th of May, which mm -hmm. will be that time by the time you end up watching this. I definitely think I will get it at some point, but honestly, one of my major uh, hesitations, I suppose, in buying it isn't anything to do with the game itself or the reviews. It's because I want to play it with my mates. What um, One of my favorite experiences at uni was playing through resident evil 7 we we downloaded the demo a couple of the guys they had no idea what resident evil was beyond oh, i was a bit but zombies or whatever so i we downloaded the demo which is arguably the scariest part of the whole game when you're stuck in the house and we played through that and it was amazing and immediately we were like right well, we're buying the, the full version then we're going to play it through the whole way uh and so i kind of want to do that again with this one but i who knows when yeah. that all uh, will that when that will even be but i definitely want to get it at some point yeah thanks for that henry i think um it's it's definitely good to know that they're trying to kind of iterate and, and they're not kind of, I know, there's a lot There's a lot there. And I think it's definitely more, um, it's more of my kind of taste of games rather than the Resident Evil 7 just didn't click with me, you know, in terms of like yeah, going a lot through of people all out horror, yeah. horror. Yeah. Um, it, it just it just wasn't my type of thing. Whereas this one, if it leans a little bit to, to more towards the action side, then it's definitely something I'm, I'm a bit more interested in. However, I'm not a huge fan of the series anyway, so I'm probably going to skip this. However, transitioning very quickly to another game that may possibly um, be on a lot of people's game of the year list that has really um, caught my attention since yesterday. Did you see the Biomutant previews of the gameplays yesterday? No, I haven't seen any of the gameplay, but I've seen, I saw some of the character creation stuff, which was cool, but I haven't got around to watching the gameplay. And Biomutant is very, very much on my radar at the moment. I just haven't got around to watching well, it. Yeah, I mean, 25th of May is when it releases, so that's a little over two weeks' time, maybe three weeks' time from today of recording. And I, yesterday I watched the gameplay... Um, oh, I'm going to get it up now. ...from Gaming Former. Get it up uh, and watch it. Holy hell, does that game look good? And they talk about a lot of things that, um, you know, just the action itself. It's just fast paced, like the, tra the traversal. <laughs> I've already jumped in and I wanted to preface it with a little bit um, something else. Last time we talked about this game, we were talking about a trailer that included like sharp edits and cuts of like 25, 30 different like cuts in like a 60 second trailer. It was probably less than that. It was like 40 odd seconds worth of trailer. And it was just like cut to one scene, cut yeah. to another scene, cut to another scene. And um, we didn't really give you a, a taste of how the game would play and how the gameplay loop would, would go. Um, but having watched this, it gives you more, and I'm more interested having watched the gameplay. And it, and it, and we say time and time again, just don't give us these shitty trailers that don't tell you anything about how the game plays. Show us how the game plays and then we'll get excited about it. And now I really am excited for this game. And they're talking about how the, um, a lot a lot of what wasn't shown off in the original trailer was just the milling around the RPG aspects, like talking with um, NPCs and and like scavenging for supplies and stuff like that. None of that is shown in, in the any of the trailers, and you wouldn't maybe expect that from a game from the game having just seen the trailers. But um, the per person who had hands off game time with it. It was just watching yeah. someone else play it. That essentially, what that means was was likening it to um, a Fallout game or something, and um, how there were different factions that you can ally yourself with and and do missions for, and and maybe your uh, it, the game lends to multiple playthroughs because of how you can um, you go about um, interacting with the world, and it's all very. It, for an independent, they called it like a, a double A plus um, developer, whatever. Um, not independent because it's, uh, it's THQ, but one hundred and one. They are yeah, developing. Yeah. Um, for for a 
uh, for a relatively unknown um, developer to be hitting the ground ru running with a game like this that looks so good that apparently has so many different mechanics like the fact oh, that yeah. you, you you know you've got this biomutant character that kind of changes and evolves and you, you can craft it from and there's loads of different mechanics in there which I wasn't expecting um I'm just ranting off the top of my head here. I haven't prepared no notes at all, but I'm that excited for this game now. Uh, and in three weeks' time, I probably be will be a day one purchase for me. H having, having before yesterday, it was just kind of a maybe, maybe not a way mm. for reviews. But having seen the gameplay and heard about first-hand experience, I'm pretty much um, decided I'm going to buy it. What I really like about it, and I've kind of latched onto since I first saw it announced, it was announced a couple of years ago at like an E3 or something, they, and then they just did like a long gameplay section, and then were basically radio silent for ages. Uh, one thing I really like the look of it, it's just unapologetically fun. It's like, we've got all yeah. these cool ideas of features and odd mechanics. Let's just smash them together and just make something cool. Like right now on my screen, as I'm talking... Uh, out of nowhere, the, guard, the the your little character rodent creature is now driving a mech. He's just marching through some yep. burnt out apocalypse city in a mech suit. When you when if you just look at the box art, it's um this like uh, raccoon looking thing with a sword. And you're like, okay, right. You wouldn't expect it to end up in a mech suit halfway through. Uh, it just looks cool. Um, it's a big hack and slash Devil May Cry esque um, over the top like melee combat, which is awesome. Uh, but then with this, like you say, Fallout is a is a common comparison between its RPG systems and how you not not necessarily systems in terms of like the constant choices or anything, but you're working with different factions, and if you piss off one, that'll benefit you in a, in another one. And I, I've said it a hundred times before. Whenever I talk about it, one of the most interesting things to me is your like character stats are represented physically on your character. So if you pick a strong one, he'll be huge and jacked. If you pick a brainy one, or yeah, you do it up in a slider, then um, his head will get bigger, and you can change the colors, and there's classes. Uh, it just looks cool. There's a bunch of cool it stuff does. put together in one game, and I, I'm really excited for it. I think this game will do really well. And I th I, part of it is the aesthetic, right? It very it looks very much like, um, for its sins, Fortnite. Uh, in, in the color palette, in the... Um, a UI on screen it is you know it, it's just it looks very you know if you if you took your character out and put like um <laughs> one of the Fortnite characters in as the playable character um it would very much look like um Fortnite in in some of the grassy areas that's for sure yeah i can kind um, of see what you mean but i think it still so has think, a lot of its own identity i think it it looks like yeah but my po i i understand i understand that but i think the point i was trying to make was that Given that it does look so cutesy and familiar to a lot of people, the the potential, you know, it, it appeals to so many different age ranges. Like you'll you'll see eight year olds, nine year olds wanting to play this because yeah. of how it looks. What but then again, you'll see let's just check. you'll see um, older games. Like I'm forty years old, right? And I'm really interested in this game. And it's not about how it looks; it's about how the game plays and it looks like it plays and the and the me me mechanics. Oh, of it's the only game. a twelve. Yeah, that's definitely gonna. Get a, a wider appeal. Yeah, so I, I think this game will do really well. I think it's one of those ones that's, um, you know, I think it was four years ago. It was um, it was first announced, and then it's just gone under the radar for so long. It, uh, you know, it, it it did spark a bit of interest among uh, a few people, not so many, but it's one of those ones that is going to come out of nowhere, and I think it's going to, you know, I. I put money on this game doing really well for THQ. That's for sure. Yeah, totally. Um, now that, um, well, I talked about it a lot, but Deathloop was my most anticipated game of this year, but since that's been booted to uh, September, Biomutant has quickly you know, filled that void, and fortunately, after being quiet for so, so long, they've they've increased their you know radio chatter for the past few weeks, dropping bits of bobs, a few interviews, some like this new gameplay. Um, and yeah, they're definitely getting ready for it. And I, I'm ready for it. I'm, I'm really excited for it. Like, yeah. When's it out? Uh, so the 25th, I think you, we said. 25th, yeah. yeah. So you're talking three weeks. <clears throat> so three weeks tomorrow. So and yeah, I'm, there you have it. I by, think it's by on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. I don't know about next-gen stuff, but I'm sure it will be at some point. Well, cu new yeah. current-gen. Absolutely. And with that said, that was just a bit of an aside. Let's move on to... Um, the community section of a podcast. This is where, firstly, um, 
I had read out all the new um, supporters for the last couple of weeks and last week, and then taking some questions from the supporters over on the Discord. So first up, the new supporters over the last fortnight, we have Rafael Soltarski, who has pledged $1 per month. We appreciate the pledge there, sir. Every single dollar matters. Every single dollar counts. And, uh, you know, it makes a difference between us being able to continue this content and not. So uh, really appreciate that, Rafael. Next up, Peter Swider Suyada. Peter Suyada, another dollar per month. Thank you very much, sir, Mr. Peter. We appreciate that. Um, and then Kona, I don't know what happens, but every every week Kona gets a <laughs> new play. I don't know if he cancels and then recancels, but we're gonna shout him out again because it's it's on my list. Ten dollars per month again by Kona. I know I know you're a you know you've been a, a supporter for a while, and the for some reason you always end up <laughs> going on this list. But there you are. Thanks very much, Kona. Uh, we've had LB twenty three uh, do a yearly pledge of twelve dollars fifty three. So uh, thank you very much for that yearly pledge there. Mr. and Mrs. LB23. And then we've had an increase in pledge by Matt Freeman from $1 per month to $6.91 per month. And uh, we appreciate that as well, Matt Freeman. Thank you very much. And if you do want to become a supporter of the podcast, of the content, head to patreon.com forward slash pretty good gaming. And for as little as $1 per month, you can get early access to this podcast, access to the Patreon only Discord section that right and then also you can ask us questions on uh, the podcasts every single week and with that said it's time for those questions this week from the discord members the patreon supporters and first up we have a quiz which is the metal shark I'm quiz i'm not looking forward to this I, I'm, I'm nervous it's for me this week so you don't you can oh is it for you um, again yeah. Oh, I see. No, it was you. It was you. Like, I think you did twice, twice in was a row. Was it last week? Yeah, man, uh, definitely. Uh, time for a quiz. For, no, it's definitely me this time. Time for a quiz for Henry. Due to not picking a specialist subject, one has been chosen for him. No, wait, I'm reading the long... Now I'm really yeah, confused. Yeah, it's at the bottom, dude. Yep. I was definitely just reading the wrong one. It was about hairstyles again. <laughs> you were, <laughs> you were case, nervous about you, last week's quiz. Eat shit. That's how bad last week's quiz was. That You, uh, you were nervous about me. it this week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get nothing right. I have looked at uh, this, uh, the, the theme of this week's, and I'm not going to get any of these right because they're about streaming services. But uh, if you want to take it away. Yeah, this quiz is for Gaz. Again, no specialist subject was given. Henry, take note. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so one has been chosen for him. Streaming services. Is it Stadia, Luna, GeForce Now, or xCloud? I'm not even sure what which one Luna is. I've heard of it, but I, I can't remember who it is. Yeah. I've never even heard of Luna. I, I, GeForce Now I've tried, xCloud I've tried, Stadia I know about, and I know nothing of Luna. So this isn't going to go very well. I'm just I'll quickly find out who owns Luna. Luna streaming service. Um, I know about a shadow, but they oh, it's closed, Amazon's right. It's Amazon's one. All oh, right. Which I mean, Amazon Gaming is in the toilet. They have no idea what they're doing. That's how. That's how good. Uh, that's how well Amazon are doing yeah. with we Luna. Is that we don't even know is. about it? Okay. The first one. Um, which one of these four, Stadia, Luna, GeForce Now, or XCloud, has a purple share button? Well, having just searched for Luna and seen that the logo is a purple mm. um, kind of weird shape. I'm gonna say I, I, I that was by mistake. Yeah, by the way, we didn't yeah. know these questions. Absolutely. Didn't look at it, but I'm gonna have to say Luna. Um, that's just a I would have gone for the same thing. But I mean, yeah, this logo is sort of like a blobby triangle. Stadia is, is uh, a red squiggle. GeForce Now, that's yeah. um, um, Nvidia, isn't it? So that's green. Yeah. And XCloud yeah. is Xbox. That's green as well. So it's got to be Luna. Has to be Luna. Correct, it is Luna. Well done. That's Boom. one from one, 100% doing well. Uh, can, we, can we finish now? <laughs> so this one I enjoy. Says it offers 4K streaming with three laughing faces. So it says okay. it does. Some... That has to be a dig at uh, Stadia, right? Surely Stadia. And you are right, it is Stadia. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay, that's again two out of two. Games can take over a minute to load. Oh, um, take over a minute to load. I would say that that is Xbox Cloud dingy. What would you call it? X Cloud. I would say that's X Cloud in my experience. If you were to say that, you would be right. It is X Cloud. 
So you're doing three out of three, wow. doing well. That is first and experience answer that. Wow. There you go. Uh, Who do you know? Which one offers ray tracing? Uh, it has to be NVIDIA GeForce because they're the they're the ones that do all the um, all the all the tech, right? You were correct. It is GeForce now. Wow. Doing very Romping well. It. Romping it. Here we go. Uh, okay. Attempts to get a native app brought onto iOS for uh, Apple and iPad, uh, iPhone and iPad got another streaming service booted from the platform. Uh, the story, if you've not covered it, but I'm not going to... I don't have time to read that right now. Okay. Attempts to get a native app brought to the Apple store and got another streaming service booted from the platform. So this has to... The other streaming service... So it's Amazon or um, Xbox, right? So it's got to be one of them two because I don't think Google have got a streaming service outside of YouTube and GeForce doesn't have a... St I would say... Native app, iOS, um, native app, X Cloud. I'm going to say X Cloud. Is that your final answer? Yes. You'd be correct in saying X Cloud. That is five out of five. That would have been mixer, right? my guess as well, but, yeah. but based on nothing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Number six lets you play games you already own. That is GeForce, NVIDIA GeForce. Yeah, that is GeForce. That's one of their um, unique selling points in comparison to Stadia, right? It was that you can stream yeah. the games you already own. Uh, exactly. Six out of six, you're doing incredibly well so far. Inexplicably well. Yeah, <laughs> remarkably. Uh, does not yet offer a monthly subscription for many Ubisoft titles. Brackets, a blessing, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Does not, not offer a monthly subscription for many of us have titles. Um, I think Stadia does, and I think GeForce. I can't now even remember what Ubisoft thing is does. called. Is it Play? Ubi Play? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's between um, XCloud or Luna. Um, I'm going to say. Well, xCloud, Microsoft are pretty kind of hands-on with their partnerships. I'd say Luna. I'm going to say Luna because they're probably the far, furthest behind in terms of popularity. You were doing oh. so well. I know. You were doing so well. It's xCloud. <laughs> it was between them two. It's 50-50. Yeah, I was going to say xCloud mainly because I re I'm confident that Assassin's Creed games aren't on Game Pass because when I before the whole Assassin's Creed Unity debacle. I was like, well, I'll check see if it's on any of the Game Passes so I don't need to buy it. And it wasn't. Uh, none of them were. Um, so that would have been my logic. And you are now on question eight and you only have seven bad. correct so far. No, six Not correct. Not too bad. Right. Drops frames instead of downgrading video when the graphics get too intense or bandwidth is constrained. Oh, which one downgrades so, video? Lose frames uh, instead sorry, of resolution. Um, oh, I don't really know this. Ah, uh, drops frames. From my experience, I would say, <clears throat> uh, I would say X Cloud. From my experience, unfortunately, you seem to have lost your stride. This one is Luna. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't know anything about Luna, so yeah. I, you know, that's we, just we haven't heard of it until it. today. <laughs> I got a couple of guesses right. Okay, right. six so far. Number nine, failed to deliver on the most advertised features at full, brackets, non-beta, slash charging money, launch, counting the number of features talked about pre-launch. Uh, so, Stadia, it has to be Stadia. Which one sure. dropped the ball hardest? And you are absolutely right, it's of course Stadia. Okay, that is <clears throat> seven so far, right? No, uh, eight? Yeah, yeah, yeah eight. it is, yeah. Seven from nine, yeah. Now, the last question. Has the highest latency? <sighs> This is tricky. Um, highest latency. I'm going to say Google uh, uh, just weighing them all up. Google are always on about how how little smaller latency is. Um, I would say it's GeForce now at a guess, at a total stab in the dark. You have missed your stab in the dark and stabbed yourself. It is Luna for number 10. Luna. Bastard. I, I did all right. You did well. Considering yeah. I wasn't, wasn't expecting to do well. You I got finished seven. up on seven. That, that's really not bad at all, all right. considering we hadn't heard of one of them. And they're, they're services <laughs> yeah. we don't really use. 
Well, two of them wrong ones were Luna, which I knew, knew fuck all about. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, if you can excuse me for them two. And I was close with the what other one that I got wrong. Yeah. So right. I, I, that was a respectable score. Good enough. Good enough. Well, thank you very much, Mal Shark, for that. I will not be looking forward to my turn next week. Yeah. If you Thanks can think of a specialist assholes. subject, go for it. But I have I have no idea what it would be. Because I feel if I pick a specialist subject <laughs> and I'm coming in, you know, Mr. Big Dick, like, oh, I know all about this. And then if I get something wrong, then I'm a tosser. But if I go in on a subject that is not my specialist subject, then what have I got to prove? You know? Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you're too scared to... To yes, say that you I know, am scared. If you know very well about uh, I'm a chosen topic, that's up to you. If you if you if you want to take that route, but uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see what happens next week. Thanks for as always, Matt Shock, for all the effort that you go to for the quizzes. Let's move on. Future Proof has the next question or the first question. Um, it's not actually a question. It just it just says, I just want to publicly shout out Earthwind Bam and Metal Shock for providing free Steam codes for WD Battlegrounds and moving out very kind. My Patreon membership to PGG is already worth it to support these two great creators with great content and podcast, especially. But not only that, there are often free game codes codes in the di- codes in the Discord. If you watch pretty good game regularly, then please support these two guys and their great community of Patreon and Discord members. It's more than worth it. I was questioning whether I should shout this out to advertise the fact that there is a channel on the Discord. We haven't mentioned it before, before, but it's the game code. So whenever you buy bundles of game codes or you get a given of game codes that you don't want, the community just tends to throw them in there and then people claim them if they want. It can be abused. Um, people can um, jump on there and just like hoard on. But we'll, we'll stamp that. We'll make sure that doesn't happen. However... What it is is an indication of how good the community is over on um, Discord. And I think that that isn't highlighted enough, that our community is one of the best communities I've ever been a part of. They're so helpful and um, kind, considerate, and, you know, they're just a friendly bunch of people who, who get in on on balance really well. I mean, there have been a couple of conflicts, especially historically in the past, there were, there were, but that's all kind of died down. And, you know, there's always... Um, a little bit of tension between personalities every now and then but you know they do tend to um, work those out in general you won't find a a more friendly helpful bunch of people Um, and that is you know and that's why I want to read this out because um, credit has to go to the community for being uh, such an awesome bunch of people Uh, so thanks for that excellent I will try and take a a, a real question this time instead of some gushing fan service here. (laughs) Uh, Angry Hobbit Zero. So, Gaz, you played a bit of KOTOR on mobile. Is it enough to get you to buy it on PC now? Would love for you to play through and see a glimpse of why KOTOR is my all-time favourite game. Not not just Star Wars game, all-time favourite game. That is a... Big uh, a bit of praise. I mean, mm-hmm. if it helps, I'll buy you a damn Steam code if you play it. Um, good question. I don't think it is enough um, because I, I, it didn't grab me. Um, not that I did disliked it. It was just that the... the um, I don't know. It, it just felt a bit dated for me. And I think that um, those type of games, they the RPG games, I think they have to, to to be so old looking would be a detractor for me. I think game, um, yeah, I end up, thinking about it now though, there's so many decent um, mechanics in that game that I'm just thinking that it would be great if they just did a, a remake or a remaster of it just to, just to bring all the visuals and the, the animations up to date, basically. I would 100% play it then. Uh, I'm just not sure I have the time. I'd love to have the time to to be able to play. I don't know how long it takes to, to complete that game. I'm guessing it's upwards of 20, 30 hours. I probably don't have the time to put into that. If it was a new game that was just released and I could talk about it on a podcast, it might be a different story. However, um, my time is pretty precious and I don't think I have that much time to commit because I know it's going to take ages. <laughs> and if I end up buying it, it'll just be a waste of money. I know that. I know what I'm like. Uh, but I appreciate the offer anyway, Angry <laughs> Hobbit, uh, and um, I'm sure it is still um, a great game. But uh, yeah, that's how it is. Uh, let's move on. Future Proof again. And there's a bunch of kind of questions here. And he starts with quotes The worst in gaming. 
rate in order of, a, of least bad to most terrible. Okay, so there's a bunch of um, bullet points oh, here. Okay. We've got a rate in order of least bad to most terrible. Always online connection required, single player, for example, Game Pass for PC, Battle.net, Outriders. Then we have full of cosmetic microtransactions, example, Fortnite. Full of pay to win microtransactions, example, Ubisoft XP. Um, next up, no controller support. Next up, unremappable controls in a game with an odd control scheme. And then we have unskippable game launch intros that take two minutes to get to the main menu. Oh, they're pretty, they're pretty annoying. And then lack of manual saving. Um, so I could start with the worst or, or the least we least worst so we can just like put the top the worst top and the bottom one what do we think um well let's get our, let's get the worst out of the way because i think undeniably the worst is pay to win microtransactions right surely that's the absolute worst of what it can be well, well that that's a good a good call however i think that always online connection required is this is something that will um affect me more because the microtransactions I always ignore. I never, you know, if it's a sing, single player game, Ubisoft game, I can I can play that game and ignore the pay to win microtransactions as um, the example was Ubisoft, the XP boosts. I can still play um, Assassin's Creed, whatever Assassin's Creed, and ignore them. I can't always, <laughs> I can't play uh, a single player game um, offline and ignore that when I don't have internet connection. Yeah. I get, I mean, always online is a real pain in the ass, especially in, with my recent experience with um, Outriders, which made me want to kill myself. Um, but I just feel like pay to win microtransactions are the worst because every, you say yeah. you can ignore it, but we know that they've fiddled the mechanics to incentivize it so that everything, That's everything takes longer, yeah. everything is grindy. So That's true. The, 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 game the game itself, is, the gameplay itself is, is affected harmed. By yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah I, I'll give you that one. Uh, uh, definitely, oh, uh, pay to win microtransactions is the top creme de la creme of the shittiest um, things in, in gaming. Uh, the, so the second, I mean, my pitch for the online, always online is, I mean, you think about it this way, right? When their servers go down, you can't play your game. Yeah. You know, they decide, uh, oh, we, we're working on our servers um, tomorrow for uh, six hours. You can't play the game during that. It's like, I paid for this fucking game. Why? Why am I? Not, why do you have to have it always online? It's a single player game. You yep. don't have to have it always online. Don't be a dick. I would say that that's. That's. I, next. I think that's it a solid case for second. See, full of cosmetic microtransactions. There's a there's a you know question there because your example is Fortnite. Fortnite's a free to play game, so do whatever the fuck you like with that. Uh, yeah. I, I think that that's you know that's not a. That doesn't bother me in the slightest. If there are free, if there are co loads and loads of cosmetics in um, in a free to play game, yeah, a full price game. However, that's when it's a a little different, and I yeah. still hate it. But it, ri I mean, it depends how much I like the actual game to whether I want whether or not I'll still play it. If that makes sense, like if yeah. I if I really if it's my game of the year and then it's also got downloadable skins. I'll, pro I'll probably still play it and still enjoy it because like we said with the other ones you can just ignore it but it doesn't mean I like it yeah I think it depends on whether it is a full it is a paid game or not to me I think if it is a free game like Fortnite which is the example here we have to go we have to think that um, that's what he's aiming at here it's a free game but full of cosmetic, cosmetic microtransactions because if it was a paid game it'd, it'd, it'd be different to me it'd be yeah. higher up the list um, but we'll go with we'll, we'll put that a free free game we'll make sure that's free yeah. um I mean, so if it is free i'd basically put it, it yeah right at the bottom, the bottom. I, I don't give mm. a shit you know okay so we others we've got no controller support unremappable controls unskippable gain launch intros and then lack of manual saving my lack of manual saving would you say that's well, most games have annoying? auto save and i i prefer manual saving because i think it gives makes you think a bit more on, and and have a little bit more strategy but i don't think that's that much of a big deal for me no controller support. It really depends on the game. That's right on the bottom for me. <laughs> I don't care about controller support. Well, I'm not playing, you know, a third-person action game with a mouse and keyboard. It's it's not happening. Well, I'll be playing uh, if, by unless it's a shooter. Unless it's a shooter. If it's a shooter, totally. Well, yeah. like, I'm not playing 
The Witcher 3 like, on a mouse bi- and keyboard. Bi- Biomutant, Bio Bio for example. I'll be playing that on a mouse and keyboard, without a doubt. Um, but I, I, I see what you're saying. It's it's one of the games that I probably might consider playing it on a um but I mean, I'll probably try both and then figure out which one I prefer. It depends how much shooting you're doing, because you can build a, a character who doesn't shoot anything. Who, yeah. Who's not a uh, shoot, shooting person. Not a shooter. Not a shooter. Um, okay, we've got to wrap this up then. So what are we going to say? Oh, I don't know. Uh, no controller support is probably a bigger deal for me than it is for you. Unremappable controls yeah. and unskippable game launch uh, intros that take two minutes to get to the menu. I, I hate unskippable game intros. That, that's the why not let me bloody skip it I think that would be my yeah. that would be my a, number three a lot of them you can mod out as well now that, but yeah just, that, that has to be number three like why take control away from the players like they want to skip through your shitty intro and it's or they've watched it for the second <laughs> or third time or whatever why why force people to do what you what you want them to do so yeah that would be number three for me number four for me would be in mappable controls and then I would say uh, manual saving would be five and uh, microtransaction six in a free-to-play game, and then seven would be no controller support. That would be my um, answers. But I think it's reasonable. I'd put no controller support. I'd probably swap no controller support and um, lack of manual saving. In fact, I'd probably put um, cosmetic and microtransactions in free-to-play at the bottom. I don't give a shit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, beyond that, it's pretty much the same. But there is a little extra tag onto this isn't there <laughs> which i think is yeah i think it's already I, I, this is already answered by someone in the discord but um the question is lastly is it bad dad joke or is it bad dad joke um it's a bad dad joke because yeah. they are dad jokes and there are good bad jokes dad jokes and there are bad dad jokes and we have they, they are like, the same bad thing dad joke. it's not jokes <laughs> yeah. about bad dads like bad dads yeah no beating their kids and cheating on their wives or whatever it's a it's no. a dad's joke that is bad not yeah. the dad that is bad thanks for the questions there mr or mrs future proof let's move on okay this is from ravage 3d quick question for henry how do you feel about assassin's creed unity oh, i'm getting triggered just reading that word how do you feel about assassin's creed <laughs> unity getting the fps boost and auto hdr support on xbox this week ha 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 pc master race ha 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 only joking sir Honestly, playing the playing this again this week, it looks and plays so great and runs with no bugs in sight. But ain't FPS boosts and the 97 games and the 97 games thus far a great deal for Xbox owners? Uh, yeah, it, it's great for uh, Xbox users, users and whatnot. But fuck me and my <laughs> and my uh, experience trying to play the damn thing. My camera has been misbehaving this entire time. I'm pretty sure it just didn't record the first half, so that's going to be hilarious to edit through. So uh, <laughs> I can't wait for everyone to comment on that immediately because they won't have got to this point, which is an hour and 14 minutes into the mm. recording. Anyway, um, yeah, it's good for uh, Xbox fans, uh, Xbox users, but uh, unfortunately, I still had rotten luck. <laughs> Right, okay, let's move on. Tons is next. So with the summer around the corner again and E3 plus the other online shows coming up, do you think we will actually see some games confirmed for this year or is this the year of the game's drought? Yes, I, I, I think this is the year of the drought. It's already been quiet and we are, well, more or less halfway through the year now. We're approaching it at the very least. And the, probably the biggest... Um, biggest name of the year is maybe Resident Evil I guess prior to that what, what have we had this year that's been you know like a ongoing franchise or you know something really really pop not Retic- Metacritic I'm opening the wrong tabs uh, I think every game that was supposed to come out this year has probably been delayed at least somewhat I still don't believe for a second that God of War is going to make it out this year yeah. Horizon might make it if they're lucky, they might they might squeeze it through to um to like a well winter kind of time release. But mm-hmm. I just I don't I think it's gonna be quiet. Yeah, looking through this list of games that have released this year, Resident Evil's the biggest one, and we're already like I said about halfway through. It's gonna be real quiet. Yeah. In terms of AAA, yeah, I would say of like uh, big yeah, it's a bit know, of a drop. chart toppers. I mean. There's still loads of good games. There's loads of good games. Deathloop, Far Cry Six is that is that confirmed or just a it's just a penciled-in date. Um, Hitman 3. 
Horizon Forbidden West. Is that confirmed for 2021? It's supposedly, but again, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see about that. Um, There's a lot of games list. that are like like Horizon and God of War that are still just 2021. There's no yeah um, further information than that. No window or anything. Yeah, and and that kind of what generally happens when you've got a release window is it generally misses the window and then you get a solid release date later on. That's generally what happens. You you very rarely get um, <laughs> games which meet their windows these mm-hmm. days, and usually they're like financial year 2021, which ends in bloody April anyway. So. Yeah. Um, as far as they're concerned, 2021 might include like January, February, March next year. Um, but there you have it. Yeah, it, it would be a good call to say that it, it would be a drought this year to say that. It well, would be speaking of um, being in financial years, I'm pretty sure that Ubisoft said a little while ago that they've got a bunch of stuff that's meant to be coming out in the, the new financial year. So Skull and Bones might just drop out of nowhere. Just be like, yeah, here's this game that's been in <laughs> development for 100 years and no one's seen anything wow. of. There's a there's a prediction for you. Um, Henry reckons Skull Any, of Bones might be at some time. We'll hear <laughs> something this in the decade, next twelve months. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, but I'm still uh, well. E3 should be interesting this year because so many companies don't give enough of a shit about it now, and everyone's doing yeah. their own thing. They proved that they could do it last year. Um, but it, more, more interesting than that, it's the new console generation. So it's it's uh, Microsoft and Sony head to head properly after Sony blew them out of the water in terms of in terms of sales you can argue oh fucking Xbox is better blah, blah. but Sony destroyed Microsoft in terms of console sales so now the, the plate is set back and it's uh, all to play for again so we'll see what happens we shall see thanks and for the question tons I believe we have one final question from Saminda popular game review websites don't have any steps taken to verify the user who's posting the review has actually bought and played the game anyone can leave a review without actually playing the game there are many reviews posted just to make the game look good or bad without even playing it this can be solved by asking to link our gaming platform account to make sure we have actually bought the game and played it and played them for some time before allowing to post reviews. This would be in the best interest of everyone, including game developers, gamers, and the review system. Is there any reason you can think of why this has not been implemented? Cheers. I don't know, and I hate it. You should have to play the game all the way through before you can review it. As a professional reviewer, uh, you should not be playing, uh, reviewing a game unless you've played all of it. As so if you're wanting to give your opinion on it or your impression, I think that is a very different thing. And it's a kind of a semantics game. But I believe you, as a professional reviewer, on especially on your big ones like your IGNs yeah. and your game spots and all that shit, you have to play it all the way through. Not 100% completion, because sometimes that's absurd, but you have to play it all. But on the flip side of that, um, publishers need to allow enough time for that to even be possible. On top of like regular work sure. and family life and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, a lot. Sometimes Especially you only get a week, huge. and that's just not enough time to yeah. smash through a whole game. That's a good point. In terms of user reviews, though, the suggestion here is that you link, um, say, Metacritic, for example. You can't review. A, you can't usually leave a user review on Metacritic unless you link your Steam account and your PSN account yep. to confirm that you have the game on your. Um, account before you leave a review i think it's a reasonable idea i'm not sure why they haven't done that before now i mean it, it, f- for my money i just go to steam uh, yeah. and look at the steam user reviews because uh, they come up with how long you've played which i think is a, a brilliant way i mean the steam reviews still aren't, aren't perfect it's still a lot of people who play five minutes and then will review it uh, say stuff about it or then you get the ones who the way it really throws me for a loop and it's like i hated the game don't buy it. Played seventy hours. Well, like you couldn't have hated it that much, friend. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to review it. You know, you're not like a journalist or anything. So that always makes well, me chuckle. While, while I was reviewing for, um, look, researching for um, the uh, Rome Total War bit earlier, I I was looking at the um, Rome Two Total War um, on Steam. Rome Two, Rome Total War Two on Steam, right? And it, what I saw, something that kind of, I'm not sure what, how I felt about it, right? In the custom reviews, there's a big asterisk and it says, period of off topics review activity detected, excluded from the review score by default. Like, you know, when people like um, review bomber game for whatever reason. Uh, and I was like, well, I can't, I can't, mm, 
Why do they do that by default? So they don't show those reviews. They omit all those review bombings for... And I looked into it on Rome 2. A lot of people were upset with when they um, patched the game and it didn't work properly for a while. <laughs> and they've omitted those. Yeah. And I'm like, is this... This sounds fucking dodgy. This sounds really dodgy. Steam want in the games to appear better than they actually are by basically censoring a lot of the reviews based on how the actual game actually plays as in if you have a bad time with one of the more recent patches that should be relevant right yeah i think review bombing on i generally don't like review bombing because a lot of the time it's people who haven't had anything to do with the fucking game and have now have never any intention of playing it or it's some like personal story thing or whatever that doesn't actually have anything to do with the game itself but in a case like that it's perfectly valid and shouldn't be excluded because it's about the actual game itself and how it plays whereas the, a lot of the time like the last of us review bombs positively and negatively they can happen both ways people spamming that as soon as the game uh became available to review on there and like you haven't fucking played it stop talking but like i said this case i think it's it's the perfectly valid reason to complain about something because the game is broken and the, it's yeah. the quickest way to just let people know, both both consumers who may be looking into buying the game, and the developers who uh, may not know quite how much of a big fucking deal it is. So there you have it. Um, yeah, I, I, going back to the original suggestion, I think it's a good suggestion. I think it would make user reviews more accurate because... Um, I, the way it currently is, if you spout off on Reddit for that you don't like something that's happening, then you can just um, get a whole bunch of people who've read that Reddit post to go to Metacritic, just downvote a, a game. And um, I'm not sure if it has any meaningful impact on the reception of the game, but um, it would be it definitely make the user reviews more um, uh, more make more sense. At least, uh, the way people approach reviews is weird. Some people put way too much stock in them, and other people. I saw. I think it was a comment on <clears throat> maybe Game Informer's Resident Evil thing. They said the game is reviewing like mixed. I'm like, it's got like an eighty something across all three platforms. What are you talking about, mixed? Since when was an eighty? I think it's eighty two and eighty four. Since when was that mixed? You, you're talking out of your ass, mate. Yeah. And I think he went on to say, oh, I guess we're not we're not getting a big 10 out of 10 blockbuster this year. And I'm like, right, for fucking starters, this isn't your opinion. It's, it's other people's opinions. Wait until you can play the game yourself. And they said, maybe Ratchet and Clank will be it. But bullshit. You, know, you don't know. You're saying that a game might be 10 out of 10, but you don't. You have no idea. Uh, sorry, mine are, mine are around there, but I hate it. People yeah. people are weird about reviews sometimes, man. I just think it's it's really unhealthy for yeah. for the discourse. Yeah, they get they get possessive over their own opinions, and then they just start ranting either but, way. Yeah, they're possessive they over like their the opinions, they but they, they've just copied them from somebody else. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, thanks for your questions this week, guys. If anyone has a question for next week, leave it, leave it in the podcast questions channel on the Discord, and we will move on to the next segment, which is normally the Trigger Fanboy Comment of the Week. However, we don't have a Trigger Fanboy Comment of the Week, so we're just going to move on and just, you know, just move on quietly uh, to the YouTube comments, the top YouTube comments for this week. But first up, I've got this more kind of discussion heavy weighted uh, comment. Um, uh, somebody who disagreed with me last week, Soul Echolong, and a couple of other people raised the same point as well from last week's podcast. Sorry, guys, heavily disagree, disagree on The Last of Us 2 trailer not lying to its player base. They lied and misled as best as they could without outright saying it. They modified Joel's look and even had him say someone else's line that stated something like, we'll go together to Ellie. I think the line was, um, you think I was going to let you do it alone or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, it was bald-faced lie, and I'm not exactly happy you guys keep saying it wasn't. A trailer gives us a hint at what we're going to be playing, and they specifically made it to make people think Joel will continue to be a part of the story. No one's asking for the trailer to spoil everything, but no one is also asking to have it uh, insinuate that a beloved character will be in it only for them to not be in it. It's not cool and pull the rug right out from under the people who didn't watch any spoilers and find out in real time that they were lied to. Don't defend these types of misleading tactics. Um, having having said that last week that I don't think the, the trailer lied, I, I did miss an important um, bit of information was that they did um, take Joel... Um, <laughs> they, they must have recorded it separately, right? But Because it wasn't in their final game, but there was a part where... Um, Ellie gets um, hand on the mouth and gets pulled yeah. to the side by what was the character? Jesse. The, 
Jesse. Totally uh, and Jesse out. says, do you think I'd let you do this alone? Uh, but in the trailer, it was Joel that did that. And they, they purposely recorded those lines with, um, uh, with the voice actor and uh, animated that scene um, for the trailer as it appears. Um, so I, I wasn't taking that into account when I said that I don't think the trailer lied to us. But it does raise the question, how far is a trailer allowed to go in terms of balancing marketing the game, getting people to buy it, mm. versus actually being, has to represent exactly what's in the game? So, because the argument here is that a lot of people were made to feel like Joel was part of the journey this time because of that scene. That when Joel says that line to Ellie, you, let, you think you'd let me um, let you go and do this on your own? Doing this or whatever he's implying there means that he's going to be fighting, he's going to be journeying, he's going to be on that road with Ellie, which he wasn't. And the implication is there that you get to play as Joel, which you don't. So that is the that is the lie, right? But it's only by implication, not by boldface, um, you will play as Joel. Yeah, honestly, it may make me a hypocrite, and so be it, but I honestly don't give a shit about that yeah. that, that example. It doesn't bother me in the slightest again. Like, yeah, may, maybe it makes me a hypocrite or whatever, but I genuinely don't have a problem with it because it's all story stuff, and it's open to interpretation anyway. If it's literally a lie about gameplay, like a, um, yeah, um, your like Anthem's trailer from E3 when they're flying around and it, it's just not what the game is like at all, yeah. that's, to me, misleading. This is story stuff. I, you can mislead me about the the game story all you like because it's a trailer. I I'm you know there's I understand they are different as long as it's not spoiling. Like, you know that's the but it's that's implying where I'll go. it's implying it's a lie by implying that you get to play as Joel, right? That's that's where the lines are kind of blurred because the implication based on what he says in that scene, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that you're going to get to play as him or he's going to be, be there be with, with you, which you, is yeah. not, yeah. So yeah. I think that's where that's where it's triggered people. Yeah, I, mean, I totally I'm don't dispute that. Like, I don't dispute that at I, all. Absolutely fine. Yeah. I just it doesn't bother me at all. And again, if it makes yeah, me I'm, hypocrite, so a bit, but it doesn't bother me in the slightest. I'm kind of like you. I I think that a lie has to be an overt lie. It has to be um, crystallized. Like we're telling you, this is in the game, and it's not in the game. This kind of insinuation, this implication that something may or may not happen, that you might get a certain experience that you don't get. I think that's, it definitely is a grey area and that's why I wanted to like bring it up because <clears throat> I hadn't considered that it was a lie because I don't, maybe don't consider it a lie, but mm. I, I can see definitely why people thought it was a lie and I can see why people who bought who play, bought the game was expecting to play as Joel, I can totally understand yep, them being absolutely. upset because I was upset myself. But then again, I don't see the biggest problem with the game being the mm. trailer. I see that the biggest problem was the decision to do what they did to Joel. Uh, there's an, um, a suggestion in the tra one of the videos I watched on YouTube about this that because Joel had like a scraped face and a, and a bruise, that maybe originally Joel was supposed to be along on the journey having survived the initial incident, and then um, they decided to cut that out. So yeah, maybe that was possible. What, what happened. And that kind of um, uh, implies that maybe it was a game development thing. We, and nothing's ever set in stone during the game, game's development, and there's only towards the end or towards you know the very last few months where you, you crystallize exactly what's going to be in the game how it's going to play out in the game but you got to think like towards the launch of the game they've got to have known that joel's going to be dead by then right in that point yeah the surely game. but i mean i just i can absolutely understand people feeling feeling misled by it totally i get that doesn't bother me at all but i think the more interesting thing is why did they do it why did they feel they needed to mislead people uh, because yeah. evidently it has misled people. Absolutely fine. Why yeah. do they feel the need to do that? It was going to it was going to sell well anyway. It's The Last of Us Two, you know. Uh, you could. They didn't need to do that. It, it does feel. And again, I understand if I'm a hypocrite for saying I don't care about it, but it does feel kind of underhanded and, and a little bit dirty. They're yeah. trying to suggest that Joel's a bigger role in it than he is. Well, I mean, it, he, yeah. he Joel is a massive part of the game. He's just a passive part, not an active part. So yeah. I think that's a more interesting discussion is why did they do it? The game was still going to sell well. Why did they choose to suggest something? Not outright say it, but suggest that he was going to be more of an active participant when he wasn't. I think that's a more interesting conversation. It's... Um it's unsettling because you should, to a certain extent, be able to rely on the information they get from trailers, right? You should be able to trust these developers. Mm. And, and, to sh and to do that, 
just makes you think, I can't trust these fuckers in future. I can't, I can't, well, no, no matter what's in the trailer, for, for them to imply that Joel was a playable character, I can, yeah, totally get why people are upset and totally get yeah. why they felt lied Absolutely. and misled to. Um, and maybe I wasn't sympathetic to that last week, that's why I'm, I'm bringing this up, but it, it's just they're like, making a rod for them back, aren't they? Naughty Dog in future, it's like, I, <laughs> it's just, it just adds another, you know, the whole cacophony of bullshit that went on during the launch and, and really up to launch with the, um, with all the leaks and all that shit, they're not making it easy on themselves, are they? By doing this, by pulling this stunt. Yeah, it was one thing after another after another. Yeah, uh, yeah I, t- I, t- so I totally I've got get it though. One here, also on last week's podcast from uh, Zooey. I'm going to say Zooey. It's quite a nice one. Uh, I def- So this is talking about my. I reviewed near near replicant last week, and I answered. Uh, there was a comment about it. How I should have compared the remaster to the original a bit more and not so much to the sequel uh, near automata slash automata we say both around here okay but his <laughs> comment is i definitely think you did the right thing with the near review it's about being relevant to your viewers and who they are likely to be people who played the original which is a tiny number or people who played automata automata and are wondering how it compares to that which is a lot of people the whole reason you guys are my go-to is that you present it in a way that somebody uh, is that somebody who doesn't know that ah, somebody doesn't have to know all about this niche stuff to understand your videos, and yet at the same time you do a good job of spreading the word on less popular games. Uh, I wouldn't have heard of Yes or Grace if you if it wasn't for you guys. It also helps that in the last couple of years Henry has become a seriously good become seriously good at writing and editing content. Keep up the good work, guys. Thank you. That's a really nice comment. And you're, yeah. that's exactly what I'm doing. It's not just, like I said about um, reviews are, shouldn't be 100% objective. It is subjective from your perspective, given your time in your life, your your background with whatever series it is, or your background in gaming altogether. That is relevant information that should always be shared and will always differ at least somewhat, and it is your responsibility to convey that. So I approached reviewing Neo Replicant from the perspective of I played Neo Automata slash Automata, and it is one of my favourite games, perhaps, of all time. I really, really like it. I feel like you just need to pick... Uh, pronunciation. Mate. I think just, I just go with what. Don't say I both. I don't every think time. I can anymore. I, automata. Because like, it's it's. Or, let's say automata. No, automata makes me want to die automata. a bit more. Automata, is, automata sounds nicer. I think it rolls well, off. Better. Do that because that's what I would say. But so. I think it's more fun. It, to the more you like. say automata, um, the or, more I think automata. you're taking a piss. Because it can't be automata, can it? Do you want do lettuce? Do you want lettuce? <laughs> we almost said that at the same time. Then yeah, um, pick pick one. Because uh, otherwise I'll just be. Gig- Giggly. There you go. Well done. Automator. Automator. Next up, uh, Michael Villis comments. I just need to point out with the FIFA article. This is on yesterday's video. Um, EA currently forces players to completely rebuy the entire full price game as well as a whole new ultimate team starting from scratch every year. If they made it free to play and continuously updated, they would be losing not only the annual full price fee, but also the whole new FIFA Ultimate Team money as people would just carry on with the same teams with minor changes for a few years I'm pretty sure their poor cavernous profit lines would not be able to handle those two hits apparently they need all the money in the world not the love of the, and support of the fan base and players uh, good good um Good comment there. It makes a it makes a decent comment. They they triple dipping essentially, aren't they? Have you heard of double double dipping in the past, where you know you sell a game and then sell some ad- additional extras in the past? Triple dipping every single year, man. Um, well, yeah, I think that's because you know. I suggested and I have done for a long time. Just make FIFA a free to play game, copy Fortnite system, and just monetize it with that shit. And you can do your ultimate team to get, um, fucking your your personal team the way you, that plays and looks the way you want. Well, I don't I think it 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 might would make more money the the take away the barrier to entry of the 60 bucks or however much it is now it's going up um price tag you will earn more money on microtransactions that way well you think about all the whales that every year buy the game and then buy loads of fifa fifa ultimate team packs they would lose a lot of revenue from those specific players because they'd already already have their teams and they wouldn't every year have to spend the additional hundred pounds. But I believe they're going to make up. They'll make up whatever they lose on the premium price sale by um, selling in just even a couple of microtransactions here and there to everyone who picks up the game for free. That's how all the other free to play games are because they're like, oh, I've, I've yeah. not spent anything on it. Let's buy a skin. Let's buy this. Let's buy this and buy. 
a year's gone by and you've bought four skins, which equals the same price as a as the game would have anyway. <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was a decent comment. Do you have any more? I did, but I've just lost it. Oh, here's one. I this one I quite like. Cause I I can't tell if he's actually being totally serious or not. And this is on the podcast extract about mobile games maybe being good now when you play good games on mobile from Paco or Paco. Because you were well, speaking about YouTuber, you called the cynical Brit, but it's actually the spiffing Brit. And if, in yeah. the, the extract version, I chopped that up to make it even smaller. But in the podcast, you, you fumbled about it for a, a good while. So he's got this, uh, this kind of bothered by it in just the extract, which I think is funny. Paco says, The cynical Brit is a moniker of the one John Peter Bain, aka Total Biscuit, God rest his soul, who you were talking about is the spiffing Brit. Get your facts straight. With a full stop after everyone, it yeah. like I feel like that could quite easily be him taking the piss, but it could also be him being really pissed off that you um, call this person uh, the total biscuit, but it's not him. Yeah, the total biscuit has just got such um, even now such a devout following and a bunch of people who will who will you know defend him no matter what because there's a lot of things you know a lot of people uh, attacking him for whatever reason around um, you know when everything went down, but. Um, yeah, it was a huge slip up on my part, I, and I realised at the time that um, that I was doing it, but I just couldn't remember spiffing Brit, man, and I and I and I shot myself in the foot there. And I, I understand corrected people... it in the video anyway. I put up his his logo and a little asterisk. All right, so... I made a fucking boo boo. I'm sorry, I made a boo boo. I always get make your facts straight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a bit harsh, but uh, you know, I, I put my hands up. I I I totally got it wrong, and uh, you know. I'm I'm human. There we go. Um, I like this comment from yesterday's video again about the um, cyberpunk um, game de- uh, not cyberpunk. Sorry, so the Witcher three game developer lead or whatever he was, person who already left for bullying accusations, whatever the story was. And Gem Max comments from what I've heard there. There was a lot of arguing from the higher-ups to the people in charge of Cyberpunk, which hit the lower people on the ladder involved in Cyberpunk, and that even the janitor wasn't spared from criticism. If he would have been found guilt, the whole company would have get guilty of it. He was just the least liked, or everyone under him was gunning for his job. I, I, I like... I like that he's um, give it, divulging his inside information. I want to know what else you've heard. Like, where, where did you, you know, this guy also obviously has an inside track on things um, from what he's talking about the janitor and this and that. So I don't know if he's been honest or what, but he's I mean, who just knows? Been sarcastic. But Everything just, on the internet, what, especially in the, in the wake of everything that controversially happened last year, you can never believe anything. Like, you're, every, even if it's completely innocuous, you're, part of my brain's like, yeah, but it could just be a lie. It could, it could just be a lie. Most stuff is almost impossible to actually verify. Uh, okay. true. I do have uh, one more, if I can fucking find it again. Okay, so this is on the um, Assassin's Creed Unity extract video, which was a real good time because people weren't <laughs> happy with it. It was one of the most disliked videos in a while, which I thought was hilarious. Because it was pretty clear within, well, for starters, I made a typo, which is always good fun. And this is what this comment is about. So oh, I'll quickly get to that. It used to be I tired playing Assassin's Creed Unity in 2021. It was a disaster. But it's supposed to be I tried. A few comments about that which were quite funny. Some were just like, oh, it's a typo, dickhead. I'm like, oh, yeah, make, make a joke about it. Come on, give me something, you know. Uh, this is from Jigs. I don't think it's a typo. Everyone's tired of seeing this franchise. Not gonna lie, loved Origins though. Bayek is dope. Odyssey, however, is shit and should never have been made. Love you guys. So true about their site and support. Utter, utter wank. 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 Uh, and Assassin's Creed is such a funny space because so many people hate Origins and love Odyssey. Everyone's got a different opinion about Assassin's Creed. But anyway, yeah, I thought this video was really, really funny uh, because... So many people, well, not so many people, that's perhaps an exaggeration, but we got a bunch of dislikes like really quick. F- clearly, from people who hadn't watched the video because it was out, I think it's about 14, yeah, 14 minutes long, and within seconds there were all these dislikes. I'm like, just fucking watch the video. There is someone who, um, who commented something, but I can't remember where he is, and he, he complained about it, being like, 
oh, this, I've never had an issue, blah, blah, blah. And I just, and this was like within four minutes or something, the video clearly hadn't been watched. So I, I commented really sarcastically, maybe I'll uh, watch the video, sweetie, like really patronizing him because I was, I was getting antsy. <laughs> maybe watch the video before uh, commenting because I literally address what the fuck you're talking about. Uh, but yeah, it's, who knew sharing a funny little anecdote in a in a podcast conversation would upset so many people on the internet no what, what you underestimate is how much loyal fan base assassin's creed i has really did Ubisoft. underestimate i thought we were all on the same page of being a like, huge yeah, company shit. with well no i mean there's a lot of people who are fanboys ubisoft fanboys and um yeah that's it's it's true no matter what we say about um how much we dislike the direction they've produced some good games They've, they've they've stolen some hearts and there's there's a lot of fans out there i mean all yeah. credit to them i guess all credit to them and that um concludes our youtube comments for this week let's move on to the very final co- uh, portion segment of this week's podcast which is the bad dad joke of the week Right, I've got two for you this week. First one from Raspberry. Why are frogs so always so happy? Why? <laughs> because they just eat whatever bugs them. Get it? Yeah, yeah, all right. Get it? They, eat, right. they eat all the bugs. They eat all the right. Yeah. Now, last one. Frozen Monkey says, During World War II, my granddad downed 32 enemy aircraft. Throughout the war, the Luftwaffe considered him the worst mechanic they ever had. But um, <sighs> I got three smiley faces. That one, four now. I've just clicked it. So you know, what? Well, I'm happy what what's wrong with you, Henry? Way. What is wrong? It's, it's a bad dad joke. It says so on the tin. What's it your does, problem? It does. To be fair, what were you expecting? What were you expecting? And that is it for this week's podcast. Hopefully, you've enjoyed it. If you did, and you want to support the content, head over to patreon.com forward slash pretty good gaming, and we really, really appreciate it. You might even get a mention in next week's podcast. So, on behalf of Henry and myself, we'll see you again in the next video. Until then, bye for now.